people. Okay, I think we should be recording now. So, thanks for coming, guys. Um, this is the fourth lesson, or topically equivalent the fourth lesson for Catalyst interview prep class. And today we'll be talking about trees. But before we like go in into trees, I just want to like give you guys like a brief introduction. So, uh, my name is Gung. I'm a current sophomore. I study like computer science and philosophy. I'm also part of Catalyst. Uh, I don't have that much experience interviewing, like I have not been doing competitive programming for a long time, but I did study a lot when I was in the process of recruiting. And so I think this session really is just a dialogue between me and the four of you in terms of like, what are the best practices? What are some classic interview prep, like interview questions when it comes to trees? What are the strategies and so on and so forth? Um, also, like a disclaimer, this is a dude who spends most of his time coding in JavaScript trying to teach you guys to do interview prep in Java, so bear with me. <laughs> so first off, um, whoops. today this is basically what we're going to cover, so some definitions in terms of what a tree is. So I hope, or I hope to believe, everyone here has done like a 201 equivalent at Duke or wherever you were studying, right? So trees are not like a foreign concept. Yes? Okay, cool. So we'll be going through some common strategies, like tree properties, different types of traversal, like how you can think to use of them during an interview, uh, and also different types of problems. So I feel like during an interview, you could generally say that there are different difficulty levels, right? There are some questions that you see it and you know, hey, like I did something similar to this in class when we were first learning this data structure in like an intro class. And then there are some problems where it's like, okay, I kind of know like it's related to this topic, but it's a little bit tricky because like the interviewer said you have to do it in a specific way or there is like some trick behind it. And then last of all, there are those questions where you're just like, oh my God, I don't know how to do these, right? So some common questions are listed here, and don't worry, the slides will be available to you guys. All the code that we write in this class will also be posted on GitHub, the links will be available. So don't worry if you're not like writing down notes or anything like that. But during class, we'll be doing some exercises, and I'd appreciate if you guys could follow along. Like for example, later on we'll be doing some tree traversals, and it'll be a good way for you to refresh your knowledge on like what's a pre-order traversal and so on and so forth. So first of all, what's a tree, right? Um, I feel like trees are a very special topic because trees, I would say, are very esoteric. Like if you get a tree problem, it has a tree strategy. It's not really like a string problem or like a linked list problem which could be solved maybe using an array list. Trees are like a special type of data structure which have a very specific way in which you can study for, right? If you have no clue what a tree is, you have no clue how to traverse a tree, there's almost no way you can get started on a problem. Like It has nothing to do with logic. It has to do with just do you know the content or not. So like just a brief definition of what a tree is. I would say a tree is basically like something that has a node and pointers. But then you're wondering, so what's the difference between a tree and a linked list? So technically, a linked list can be a tree. Or you can think of a linked list as a tree that just traverses one way, right? So a tree is something that has a very fixed structure. And in this class, we'll be focusing on a special type of tree called binary search tree. But before we go into that, I kind of want to talk about the more general superset of this type of tree, which is called a binary tree. So on the left side over here, there are like some common definitions that you might hear in an interview for binary trees. So like a, what is a full tree, what's a complete tree, and what's a balanced tree. So these are some terms that you will need to study and it might come up in an interview. But the good thing is if you've never heard of it or if you forgot, there's like no shame in clarifying with your interviewer like, oh, like I forgot like the definition for a full tree or a complete tree. And your interviewer will be really happy to share with you. So as long as you can understand like what a tree with every node having zero or two children means, you pretty much don't really need to memorize these information. On the right side though, that's the most important thing. So if you've like been exposed to trees before, then you should be familiar with the different types of traversals. I would say in general there are four, 
And basically any kind of tree algorithm or like any kind of strategy for a tree problem comes out of figuring out how to do traversal in the tree and taking that traversal or rather picking the right traversal and mutating some part of that traversal for your objective, right? It can be a search. So you're searching for a node with some conditions in the tree. How do you pick the best way, the most optimal way to traverse your tree that fulfills your search condition, right? It can also be construction of a tree, right? How do you construct a tree if you don't really know like what structure it has or how you should traverse it? So those are some strategies that we'll be looking at afterwards. So before we move on, I want to clarify, like, are people clear about like what a binary tree is? So it's like right there, has nodes with at most two children. There are trees with three and like more and more like children, and there are trees that are not graphs yet. But for this class, and I would say for most interview questions, you will not be seeing anything like that. Anything more complicated would then become like a graph question. So moving on to binary search tree. I feel like this is the one tree that you need to know by heart, right? And the cool thing about binary search tree is don't think about it as like an abstract data structure that sometimes comes up. The binary search tree exists because it's actually super useful. And the reason why it's so useful is because it makes searching faster. And if you're like familiar with the concept of binary search, like a binary search tree is basically a data structure that was specially created to optimize binary search. It kind of like just works really well with it. And I think the key thing here is that each node's value is greater than all keys stored in the left subtree and less than all keys stored in the right subtree. So this is a key property that defines a binary search tree. So if you walk in an interview and the interviewer is telling you, hey, I want you to tell me something about this binary search tree, right? The first thing that should come to mind is what are the properties of a binary search tree? Because this is what will help you later on when you're thinking about the problem to define the context of the problem. And if you need clarification, always go back to like what are the fundamental properties of the, the data structure. So I just want to say like, this is actually super useful because sometimes when you're in an interview, you can be like a little bit confused. But the key thing about the binary search tree is you can search really fast and basically you get like all of login time. It's like basically binary search time, right? Um, some things that you may or may not need to know, but I would say are very important, are the things on the right, which are how to do search, how to do insertion, and how do you delete things. So we won't be doing any problems that involve deletion, but if you have time after class or in your preparation for your next interview, you might want to look into that if you know that there's a high chance of trees coming out. So search in general, I would say, is really straightforward if you need to do it recursively or if you're allowed to do it recursively. But an, inter like an iterative implementation of search may not be as easy as it may seem. And I would say for the medium level and above questions, you often find yourself using iterative approaches because most of the time an iterative approach has better runtime. And that has to do with uh, obstacles with recursion, because many times when you're defining your base cases in recursion, your recursive function kind of works in a way that would recurse the entirety of all of your nodes. It's just the way how you write recursion, that it has that special property that kind of makes it neat to take into account all factors other than the base case, right? Whereas with an iterative approach, you could easily just add a condition if this just exits. And then you'd save so much runtime. And the last question we'll be looking today, we'll be looking at an example that if you would use like a recursive approach, the runtime will be significantly longer as compared to an iterative approach. So before we move on to strategies, um, I just want to ask are there any questions about what a binary search tree is or like just anything in general. It doesn't have to be relevant to this, could be Maybe you have some experience with an interview and a binary search question came up or like a binary search tree question came up. Any questions so far? No? We're all good? Perfect. So this is, I think, the most integral part about understanding trees. Like if you understand 
how to traverse a tree, you're basically 80% there for any kind of tree problem, right? Because once you understand the techniques behind how to manipulate the data structure, all you need is the remainder of the 20%, which is intuition on which traversal techniques you should be using, how to use those techniques. So we're going to be talking about these guys. So pre-order, in-order, post-order, level order. And there's no time to talk about DFS and BFS today. But I just want to put it out there at the start. So tree traversal is not, strictly speaking, conceptually, a search. A tree traversal, you're traversing the tree. So by definition, you need to traverse all of the nodes, right? It's like I'm walking. I'm walking through all of these pit stops, right? Whereas for depth first search or breadth first search, what you're really doing is you're searching for something, right? So many times people get confused, like, is pre-order traversal DFS? Is level order traversal BFS? The technical answer is a BFS is the superset of a level order traversal, and a DFS is the superset of pre-order, in-order, and post-order traversals. And that's just because it's the way you think about how you're walking through the nodes. But strictly speaking, I would not call like a pre-order traversal a DFS because you're really just traversing all the nodes, right? You're not searching for anything yet. So I just want to make this distinction conceptually in case like any of you guys get like confused or I feel like when you're doing interview prep, you use Stack Overflow a lot, right? You're on lead code. There are people that post their solutions and sometimes they call, like they explain their methods in ways that may not be necessarily true. Like some people might talk about like a pre-order traversal as a DFS. I find that's pretty common, especially like uh, on places like Lead Code. Like everybody says, oh yeah, just do a DFS. But I think it's important to be clear about the definition and your interview will appreciate your understanding of like what the fundamental properties of each term are. Yeah. So just to be clear, a pre-order is not a DFS because you don't handle the key until the very end. Is that why you're saying it's not a DFS? Oh, so I'm saying a pre-order is technically like a subset of DFS. Mm -hmm. Except like don't mix up the concepts. So like when you're doing a pre-order traversal, you should be thinking I'm doing a pre-order traversal and not I'm trying to do a DFS. Because I feel like you're in different like strategies when you're thinking about doing a traversal and when you're thinking about doing a search. And that will affect how you think about your code later on when you start writing it. Sorry if I wasn't clear, and thanks Bobby for the clarification. Yeah, like my whole point was you should be like in the right mindset when you're thinking about your problem. So I just don't want you to like make the common mistake of mistaking um, like a search with a traversal when in fact code wise <laughs> they look very similar. Right? Like if you wrote like a DFS, it would look very similar to like an in-order or pre-order traversal. So okay, enough on that. So later on we'll be doing some tree traversals and we'll also be looking at the depth of binary tree, so on and so forth. So for the first exercise, I have a super nice looking tree here. Can you guys just like take five minutes and write down like on a piece of paper or on your laptop the pre-order, in-order and post-order traversals of this tree? And if you need like clarification on like what a pre-order traversal is or like how to do it, just raise your hand like I'll come to you or one of the instructors will. What's up? No, I'm just drawing it.
what's the progress like? Are people done with one traversal? More or less? Well, are people done? Okay. Hi. Are we all done? Do you need more time? Is anyone still not done? We all good? So everyone has like three different traversal, like array looking things, right? So let us verify if that's right. So I have like a So these are the um, traversals. So let me just zoom in to verify. Did everyone get it right? Or like, did anyone have a problem? Like, was there anything that we need to clarify with regard to like your understanding of a traversal? Like how to look at the tree? What's up? So I think post order for me was the hardest one to get. Can you walk us through like pointing at the, at the individual nodes and why it ends up being that? Oh yeah, for sure. So before like um, walking through the diagram, I just want to say so when you're traversing through like a tree, it might be more useful to think about the process recursively. So like there's a recursive process for each like tiniest possible binary search tree, which consists of three nodes, right? You have your root node, and then you have your left child, and then you have your right child. So recursively, that means that all of your many, many subtrees in your giant binary search tree all need to adhere to the way you're traversing them. So to do post order, so let's just try to remember this, 1, 4, 7, 6, 3, 13, etc. right? So this is the tree. Let me just enlarge it. So when you're doing post order traversal, what you want to do is you want to go left first, right? And then you want to visit your um, your node, or in this case, it'll be the data. So you're gonna keep going left all the way, and that's why you get left first. And then, so the first, when you're at eight, right? So you go left, and then you start to go right. And then you start to, so how it kind of works is you go left and you like visit like all of them. So as you keep recursing downwards until the last like level of nodes, you would eventually hit one first. And then 
after you hit one or uh, is there like a better way so i feel like my explanation may not be very clear because like it's difficult to point out like the exact like what is happening but basically what happens is you have a recursive process that some looks something like this so this is basically what's happening right if you guys can see it so if you think about your code like recursively and we can go into how it's iteratively done afterwards but you're calling this function on some node right the moment you hit the first like left node you keep calling it all the way and for each node that gets called on its corresponding like left child right child and its root also get called recursively on and that's why when you're going post order usually the first thing that you hit would be the leftmost like bottom node and then from then on depending on the structure of your tree it would go in like reverse order of the sequence of which nodes were called first and that's why over here you get a sequence of one four seven six and so on so if we go back to look at the three right so you hit one first and then you hit four followed by seven so the reason why it's not one three six or like one three four is because you're gonna go left first and then only when you hit like a null at the end then it will return the value that's being printed and then your recursive process will know that the next one will be the leftmost again and at this point there is like a right side right because there is a right side with a null crucially so if after seven there was something else it would have gone down to visit those children and try to print those so one four seven followed by six three thirteen fourteen so over here once you're done with seven you basically come up to six and three because this recursion came from the subset of the original eight which started with visiting the left node so like three like when you visited three that basically kicked off the recursion for everything in the subtree under three and that's why like it goes in this sequence and then over here it comes back to 13 followed by 14 10 and 8 so you can kind of see the pattern right like from 8 it doesn't go to 10 it goes straight to 13 14 and then 10 and that's really like what the post order is trying to convey in terms of different ways to view like how data is being structured in the tree wait was that clear or do i need to what's up yeah for sure like this page yeah. so in the pre-order traversal you see eight is first post order you see eight is last um and in, in order you see eight is exactly in the middle and can you go back again and then now you see three right three has one and six and then if you go back again you'll see the same exact trend on both sides of the eight so where the three is in the first one three um uh for I think the first one's pre mm -hmm. The three comes before its children one and six. And the second one, in, uh, in order, three um, is between its children one and six. And in post order, one and six are after three, which and three since the child of eight, or sorry, one and six are before three, and three since it's a child of eight is after, I mean before eight as well. So you can see like the nesting in the list itself. Did people get that? Okay, cool. So this will come in useful because the first question we'll be doing after this will kind of need us to know like what the pre in and post order like travel like traversals of this tree is. So before we move on, I want to do an example on how to iteratively traverse a tree. So I want to ask you guys like, is there any implementation you would prefer, whether it's pre order, in order, or post order? Anyone? Post order. Post order? Yeah, okay, so post order is kind of harder to think about and also to code. And the reason is like, um, it's just a very counterintuitive way to approach your nodes, right? So if you remember the sequence from just now, like the first thing that came up was one. Sorry, it was uh, one and then four and then seven, and then the next thing like goes up like that. If you just erase anything about trees or traversals in your mind, just look at this picture 
and think about how you would pick these balls, right? It's just so counterintuitive. So to actually like write that out in a way that's iterative, which is, yeah. Well, I, I remember that the reason for post-order traversal is when you want to say delete all of the resources in a given tree structure without mm -hmm. leaving any danglers. And from that, sense, that point of view, it makes a lot of sense. You have to get all of the leaves before you delete any parents. And then you move on up to the parents of the leaves and you keep on going up and that's exactly what it does. So like, if I think about it that way, it does make sense. No, you're exactly right. So I think thinking about it that way, like there is a clear use case, as you say, for post-order. But when you're trying to write something iteratively, it might come off as slightly counterintuitive in terms of how you would do it. Like just imagine a for loop, right? How would you for loop to this node and then to this one? Like what conditions would you have to iteratively ensure that you have your post-order? You would use a while loop? Yeah, a while loop or a for loop, like whichever. Oh, do you, were you going to say something? I'm just thinking. Oh, oh, okay. So, all right, let's do a post order. So, I actually have the code, like, written out already. And I'm not sure, like, if we have the time to, like, code it out. But I guess we'll be doing more problems afterwards. So, I'll just, like, walk you guys through the code right now. Because, like, I want you guys to have some time to actually, like, try to write codes for the questions after this. So in any case, like all of this will be made available to you guys after the class. It'll be on GitHub. So like feel free to go through it and like look at like my implementation of like how to do the iterative versions of traversal. So over here, like um, I decided to use two stacks to do my iterative post order. And the reason you kind of need like two stacks is because it makes it super easy to keep track of like what you should pop from the stack. And then why is that the case? We'll go into it after we like go through the code. So right here, all I'm doing is I'm just creating two stacks, right? And then this is my base case. So if it's null, I'll just return. And the first thing you want to do is you just want to push your root into the first stack, right? So you can imagine you're in an interview and you've thought of a solution that requires a post-order traversal. And at this point, your interviewer is like, hey, like, I know it's super easy to do it recursively, so why don't you show me how to do it iteratively? You're like, okay. So you want to kind of explain to your interviewer. So like, when I think about the post-order traversal iteratively, like, one way to do it is to think about it using this stack data structure, which all of you are familiar with, right? And the reason kind of why like, you need two stacks is... The first stack is basically what you want to use to keep track of like the things that get added as you traverse down. And then the second thing is the thing that helps you like balance the like post order sequence. So once you've added our first node into the first stack, the next thing we're going to do is use a while loop. So while this first stack is not empty. So while it's not empty, what we want to do is we want to pop an item from the first stack into the second stack. And we'll see why this is important afterwards. So once you pop it, you want to push it into um, the second stack. And the next thing you do is you want to push the left and right children of that stack to stack one. So you see over here, I have my temp. So stack one is here, stack two is here, right? Originally, we have our root comes into stack one. I popped it over here. And I called it temp. So in temp, I kind of want to know like what its left children and right children are. And I want to take them, pop it back into stack one. Right? So right now, at this point in our code, stack one has two nodes, and stack two has one node. So while that's the case, we keep repeating this process. So basically, you would end up having like a, a stack of like huge bunch of like things in stack one and only some things in stack two. So if you think about what's happening over here, right? That's basically what your post order is, right? Like, um, I think, uh, wait, sorry, what was your name? Brian. Yeah, like Brian's explanation for the use case of a post order was really good because when you're taking the like node from the first stack, you're popping it into the second stack. 
and then you pop the nodes children like left and right into this stack right what you're basically creating is a way for you to traverse post order iteratively because if you think about it the left and right children that get popped here need to go through the process of being popped back to the second stack too so by the time you're done with popping like left and right left and right what you would have is in all of like in stack two you'd have the entire post order sequence wait did that make sense or like do people have questions it's kind of hard to like visualize it but yeah yeah so if you push the root and then at every single point you're popping off like the last item of the stack and then pushing it onto on the stack two but every single time you're pushing it in the order of like the left and the right children, it, it seems like you would keep popping off the last right child, right? Because the right child is always going to be the top thing on the stack. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that like a little bit more? Oh, so basically, like this goes back to how you're doing the like the traversals, right? So if you can imagine, like our iterative approach starts with eight first, right? So you're given the root, and then you want to go down iteratively, and then you want to start popping things. So A goes into stack 1, and then it goes into stack 2, and then you have the left and the right, which is 3 and 10. Right? So these things get popped into stack 1. And then if we go back to the code, over here, you're going to start popping the thing on the right. So that would be 10. right? And this has to do with the properties of binary search tree, basically. Right? So on the left side, you kind of want to pop it back. So you have uh, the left and the right. So the left goes in first, and then the right goes in. So you start popping the right to the other side. right? And once you're on the right, so this would be the 10, right? And then you start looking for children, and then you keep repeating that process. And the reason is so that, like, at the end of it, the thing that's at the bottom of your stack two will be the last thing, like the reverse order of your post order. So the first thing on top of your like stack two will basically be one, followed by four, so on and so forth. So just to clarify, even though normally we would go down the left side of the tree first, we're going down the right side of the tree in this case because we were actually keeping the reverse order on hand, and mm -hmm. at the very end we're going to reverse that reverse order. Yeah, order. yeah, basically. The forward post order. Yep. Okay. Yes. Wait, did you guys get that? Okay, cool. So, yeah, like, this is one way to do the iterative, like, Traversal and can anyone tell me like what's the runtime of like this approach? So I have like one while loop and then I have another while loop Yep Sorry, yeah, pretty much so yeah, this is just my driver that tests like all these guys. So like if you after class go into like GitHub and everything, like the code is just runnable. You just need to like clone the repo or like the respective like subfolder. And then you can just like compile it yourself using like Java C command in the command line and just run like the binary tree class. Um, and all of the other questions will kind of look like this. So you can just keep compiling and then running your binary tree classes. So cool, let's move on to the next. Question. So, I would say like interview questions for trees in general are like a super big topic at a lot of the bigger companies. Um, like from my experience interviewing with like a lot of like the big companies, trees are something that you should expect to come out. And the reason is because trees are very useful in real life. Like a lot of big companies core software run on data structures that are trees or are some like esoteric customized version of a tree. It could be um, like, for example, like Bitcoin runs on like Merkle trees, right? Like if you're interviewing for like a fintech company, you might get asked to write a specific type of tree. And 
If you don't know like what those three properties are, your interviewer will explain to you. But having a good understanding of what a tree is and basically like the types of strategies you can use, which are always the same, like traversals, like how do you do search, these will be super useful. So the first question that we have for you guys is given a tree, give its pre, in, and post order traversals, and then pick a type of traversal as input and construct a binary search tree. So you already have the pre, in, and post order traversals of this tree over here. And before you guys like start implementing this solution, I just wanna like walk through like how I would have approached this question if I walked into an interviewer and this is what the interviewer told me. So first of all, I think the fact that you've been asked to construct a binary search tree is a keyword, right? So whenever you like know that it's a tree question, the first thing you wanna really clarify is what kind of tree are you dealing with? Because this, like the solution to this problem would have been very different if, for example, it were not a binary search tree, but just a normal binary tree, right? Because a binary search tree is a very specific type of tree with certain properties that you should know. And so once you've been told, okay, it's a binary search tree, the first thing that should come to mind is, okay, like what are the properties, right? My left children should be maybe smaller, my right children maybe bigger. And if you like realize that you're in a situation where you're not too clear about some of these properties, it's okay to tell your interviewer like, hey, like I don't really remember this and ask them to try and remind you at the start, as opposed to you go in and then you kind of know what it is, but you're not too clear about what the properties are or how to implement it. So I feel like interviews are both time management problems as well as content problems, right? Like you don't want to spend too much time coming up for your solution because you still need to code it out. So if you're at a point where like you don't really, like you're not too sure about what properties or like what strategy to use, Try to like signal to your interviewer to give you some help. Like that's completely valid. So the next thing I would have taken note of was, okay, so this is the problem I have, right? I have three traversals. Which is the best way to basically pick a type of traversal and construct my tree? Like what information do I need to construct a tree? Like something useful would be like what node to start my tree with, right? Would you guys say like that's super useful? And which of these three traversals, or maybe more than one of them, do you think would be super useful for that? What's up? Wait, I have a question as to like, do they have to be unique? Like, is there only one binary search tree? Does it have to be like uh, balanced, or is, there, is it just any binary search tree? That oh, that's a good question. So this question is kind of ambiguous. Yeah. But I would say. Since you've clarified with the interviewer, like he could tell you, for example, okay, a balanced binary search tree. And if that's not possible based on this tree over here, so this tree is not balanced, right? Um, where's that tree? Like this tree is not, but because you have this diagram at the start of the interview, you kind of know you want to reproduce this tree. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's the, you want to reproduce the exact tree that you mm -hmm. and not some other Yeah. Okay. So, do you guys want some time to like, try to implement this? Should we break up into like groups and talk it over? Oh yeah. Alright, groups of twos then, since there are only four of you. <laughs> One way to what? One traversal to another traversal. Say we have given up three order traversals. Mm -hmm. An array of that. Okay. And then you want to get the in order and the post order. So without thinking too much about like the exact semantics of like how do I recognize a pattern of in order given a pattern of pre order, 
like the brute force method would just be, okay, let me just construct a tree, and then I'll just do like what I know, how to recurse it properly, right? So that's definitely a valid solution. But I would say, if you want to just look at an array of like a pre-order sequence and be able to pick out like how it would look like in order or post order, the first thing I would do is I would draw out that array as a tree. And that would help me visualize the problem. And after that, I'll look at so where are in the like index property of all my arrays, where are all of my like nodes? And then I will try to compare that with a pre-order. So without programmatically coming up with a solution, I would have come up with two examples, right? My pre-order tree and my in-order tree. So no code yet. Look at those two. And then I would try to compare them and see where the pattern is. So I, I would say like basically the pre-order and in-order traversals are kind of different because of the way you pick your nodes, right? So there is a specific order which Looking at it linearly would not help because your tree like kind of defines how the pattern is made, right? If you had a balance tree, it would be very obvious that you just need to switch like switch certain like indices of each like parts of the array. But if it's an imbalance tree, then it could be really anything. So depending on what the question is, I would say like that's my that would be my approach. Just like visualize it and then talk it through, and then come up with the solution that fits the most. And if not, always go with the brute force solution. Yeah. Cool. Like, do you guys want to talk about it? You have two minutes to tell me like which like, of the three that you picked. Like, not implementing it yet, just like suggesting why you chose this traversal type and like justifying like why that's useful. You guys are not discussing. <laughs> Using your like psychic powers to talk about this. Yeah, I think it really helps to like, try to draw this out. I don't know if anybody brought paper, but like I can bring up the tree again. Should it be like any tree described by that? Like, it it needs to be this tree. Um, yeah, because you could use any tree. You could use a random order of nodes yeah. and construct a binary tree from that. That would be too easy. So to clarify, mm -hmm. you're given one of the uh, traversals, and you have to come up with a binary search tree. So you're given all three traversals, and you need to pick one. Right. And then based on the one you picked, come up with a way to construct your binary search tree using that traversal. Okay, but it doesn't have to like end up being this because it needs to end up being this. That exactly. Yeah. How can you only use one traversal to make, like... You can. 
So your algorithm has to make this happen. Yeah. Okay. That's even harder. Um, so what is this tree? This is just a binary search tree. It's not a balanced binary search tree, but it's a binary search tree. So, John, I forgot to mention this, but the in order traversal of a binary search tree is just everything in sorted order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, that means that an in order traversal would be kind of useless because if you were given any traversal, you could just sort it to get an in order traversal. Um, you you can use in order. It's just like if you only had the in order. So I'm saying like once you pick it, you only have access to that. Yeah, I'm just asking in general because you can't do post order. You can. You can. You can. Yeah. Because like post and pre are basically like the same thing. Pre is easier. Yeah. It's a BST. Yeah. Yeah. All right, time's up. <laughs> what up? So, left side of the class, what's your choice? I'm still trying to it is. So, like, the order has to tell you, for example, whether 13 is the child of 10, the left child of 10, or mm -hmm. specifically the left child of 14. So, you're so, given the exact sequence of the order that we saw over here. Right. So, but you can only use one. You can only use one of them. Yeah. What else can you go with? Yeah, that's that's a valid way. What about the right side of the class? Okay, like did you guys discuss, or this is just you? What about the gentleman behind? Like, what's your opinion? Okay, so I think um, like this dude. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. No. Oh, you have to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, his approach is definitely a valid like way to think about how you might recreate the binary search tree. So the most important thing about the binary search tree is you understand its properties, right? So if you're given three different traversals, I would say. You kind of know what each reversal represents, but you don't know where to start. So for this problem, it's possible to do it using pre-order and post-order. But I would say doing it pre-order is a lot easier because you don't have to like pre-process your post-order in order to know when to start, like which is your root node that starts off your construction. And basically after you've pre-processed it, you kind of get something that looks like pre-order which is like kind of lame. So pre-orders, the way to go. So um, do you guys want to like, do you want me to code it out? Do you, does someone want to spend time to like trying to implement it and then come up and do it? Or do you just want to do a like, just look at the code, 
because we have two more problems after this, and we have about roughly an hour, and those people might need to go. So. With some small trees. Um, so like I have like one, two, three. Oh, okay. So good thing I, I have three. Oh, cool. Um, can I? Can you guys see if I draw it here, or is it like kind of far away? Like, can can you guys see if I? What? Like I can read those numbers. Okay, cool. So like, if you had like a tree, right? Like two. One. Like can't draw the lights. Oh. No, 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 it's the that one. This one. No, 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 the other one. This one. The one right next to it. Yeah. Okay, sweet. So, if you had like a fellow like this, right? Um, what would the pre-order look like? Anyone? Wait, can you guys see this? Yeah. Two, one, three. Okay, so the pre-order basically would look like two one three, right? So for all like pre-orders, right? You kind of know that your first thing in your array or your like your stream or whatever that's given to you in the interview will be the root node, because like that's just the nature of a pre-order traversal, right? So for this problem specifically. Like, one way to think about it is, okay, like, iteratively, what you want to do is you want to find this root node's left child and right child, right? So, regardless of what your array, like, is, sorry, what your tree is, given a pre-order traversal, you just want to keep walking in your array until you find something that's bigger than your um, root node. So, for example, um, if we had like this tree, I would want to, in my array, keep going to the next number until I find something bigger than 8. And the reason why is because that's the recursive nature of how your pre-order was generated, right? If you think about it, all of the things that come after 10 came from 8. So like, Basically, like one way to do it would have been, so let's just, whoops, come back here, right? So if I have this pre-order over here, right, what I would have done is I would just loop through my array, keep comparing for something bigger than 8, and once I find 10, I know, okay, this is my right child, right? And then I also know that, like over here, 3 is going to be, Possibly my left child. Yeah. So in the beginning, were you guaranteed to get a binary search tree to start with? Yeah. So like, oh, oh. So <laughs> I'm sorry if that's not clear. Yeah. So like this is a binary search tree. And you were told to find like something and to recreate this tree. So basically what you wanted to do is to use the fact that you know as a binary search tree to come up with a strategy on how you would reconstruct it. So like what I just said applies for the most basic like set of subtrees. So like just three nodes, right? So you can keep on doing that. So you have eight, you get three, and then you get 10. And then you do it for these guys, and then these guys, you keep going, and then you create your tree. But unfortunately, the runtime of that is O of n square. And that's not perfect. So there is a way to do this in O of n, and basically you need to optimize the way you're looking at some of these like nodes. Do people want to spend some time thinking about it? It's actually just like a minor tweak in terms of how you're finding the left and right child.
Yeah, and, yeah, sorry. Oh, just, just oh. Yeah, and, and people were wondering like the post-order implementation. It's basically the same thing with the pre-order, but you reverse your condition. So instead of looking for something that's like, yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 oh, like, yeah, you just want to like do the reverse of the condition. Okay. I think it's easier to think about like this problem iteratively than recursively. So both implementations exist for O of N approach. But when I was writing it, I thought the recursive implementation was not that straightforward. Like the O of N squared version recursively makes a lot of sense. It's just like clearly defined, these are the properties, I just need to do this and then repeat. But to optimize this in a recursive way is like slightly challenging. Can you show us what an iterative pre-order traversal looks like? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, there we go. So let me just zoom out a little bit. Can you guys see? So in an iterative pre-order, you basically want to maintain a stack. You push like your, um, your root node in, and while the stack is not empty, wait, yeah, while it's not empty, uh, you basically want to keep adding stuff and popping stuff from it. That's basically it. Yeah, in general, like stack. Yeah, you have something to say. Oh, so this is the pre-order traversal, for, like an iterative pre-order traversal. Yeah, so we we decided to use pre-order, and then I suggested that an iterative approach might be a lot easier to think about to optimize the runtime of the algorithm from n squared to o of n. So it's like okay, you have your stack, and then you're doing all these things, but how do you like reverse engineer this using the array? But can you not do an O of N recursive? You can. I'm okay. just saying like that's slightly, like I thought it was slightly challenging to implement that. Would you, can I ask, can I like tell you what I think you would do? Yeah, yeah, okay. for sure. Can you not just like pass it an array and a starting and ending index of which you want to look for in the array and then like recreate your left and your right nodes from the root? Like you say like, you know the first element is your root to mm -hmm. that node and then you can like check um, up till the first element that's greater than your node. Yep. And say that's your low to your high, and then say that your the left of your node is mm -hmm. uh, recursively called on that like subset. But that would be O of n squared. Is that O of n squared? Yeah. Uh, like if you wanted to do it recursively, you basically need to keep a minimum and a maximum. And you're always like keeping track of that. Because right now when the way you've recursed it is every subset has its own predefined like minimum, right? So you're always looking for something that's smaller. And then that involves you like going through every node all the time as you recurse. But if you keep track of like a global minimum and maximum like in some way, right, then you'd be able to recurse in a way that only needs you to go through all the nodes once. Does that make sense? Yeah, but like the recursive like implementation is a lot more lines of code than the iterative solution, which is quite bizarre, right? Normally recursion is a lot like less code. And although I say it's O of N, it's not necessarily true that you only traverse them N times. Like the iterative approach, I think at most takes two N like iterations, which is still O of N. Yeah, and that's cause like you have like some edge cases sometimes. 
So do people have like a solution or like should I just walk you guys through an example? Yep. I think so. Yeah. So like, as a hint, the, the basic idea is that you know how to iteratively do pre-order traversals. So you want to use your stack to kind of like reverse that process. And while you're reversing the process, you need to be able to like process your array values to know when to pop things and when to push things into the stack. That's basically it. So obviously you start with like the root node, right? And then you would kind of like put that into your stack. And then for each um, thing in your array, you want to assign like a temp node. And then you want to keep popping while the next value is greater than the stack's top value. So the cool thing about stack is that it's uh, kind of like stores your values in reverse. So because of that property of the stack, while the next value is greater than the stack's top value, you can just keep popping things. So when you find something that is like um, greater than the top value in your stack, you know that that's something that you want to keep. Because that's basically your first right child. And then if the next value is less than the stack's top value, you save it as the left child, and then you push new things to the stack. Okay, I feel like me talking about it is not like very clear cut. So like let's just walk through the code. Um, BST. Okay, there we go. Okay, so like um, one thing that I forgot to mention was you should always clarify with your interviewer what your data structure looks like. And most of the time they'll say, oh yeah, like like a typical DST or like a typical tree node, right? I, I find it useful sometimes to write out the different classes or data structures that you're using. And obviously if you're asked to write code, even if it's on the whiteboard, it's always good to predefine like what your nodes look like. So this is quite straightforward. Like this node has like a, it stores data as left and right. So we were talking about it just now. So this is kind of like the O of n squared solution, in which like you kind of just traverse through your array, find the biggest, and then you kind of keep repeating that process recursively. Yeah, and like uh, I have both iterative and recursive solutions here. So like if after class you guys want to take a look at that. But basically, in the iterative version, what you do is first, so pre is the name of my array that contains my pre-order traversal. And size is the size of my array. So what I'm going to do is I'll take the first element in my array, and I'll create a new node. And then I'm going to push it into my stack. So for the amount of elements in my array, what I want to do is First, I'll initialize a temporary like node that's null. And then while the stack is not empty and the element within pre is greater than the first item in it. So this is kind of similar to what we were talking about just now, right? So all this condition does is look for the next element within your array that has a greater value than the first value, which is your root node. So we're looking for the right child now. So once we get that, we want to pop this value inside our stack, so your current root, into temp. So your temp is now uh, the root node, and your stack is now empty. And then this will just terminate, right? So the next thing you want to do is, so if the temp is not now, i.e. like your tree actually exists, um, what you're going to do is you want to assign temp.write, with the new node, which is in the element that we last tracked. So when this line of code executed, we had an i value, which 
just kept on going. And so this i value is going to be the index value of the element in the array, which is the right child. Like that makes sense so far, right? So we're going to create a new node using that value. And then we're going to push that into the stack. And that's it. So like over here, you see temp dot right here. So temp is eventually going to end up becoming like the tree. So temp is what we're using to keep track of the tree that we're constructing. And over here, when I say temp dot right, I'm effectively saying root dot right is this value, which is greater because I know it's going to be my child element. And then the next thing we do is we want to push it into um, the stack. So if temp is not null, right? So we'll push it into the stack, and then this process keeps on repeating. So if you get like a value that's less than the stack's top value, so we just want to peak that value at the top and put it on the left. So your i basically is something that will keep track of where it is in the array. That's basically it. And then at the end of it, you just return your root, which will be like the first thing in your, like your root and your temp are kind of like synonymous. Like your temp is always changing. Like the value that the temp variable is pointing to is always changing. So like your temp is always pointing to the current subset or subtree that we are constructing. But your root is the one that's like the root that will define the whole tree. Like any questions? What's up? Yeah, um, I'm just, I, I get that this works, but can you explain why you won't like lose any like nodes? Because it seems like uh, that first while loop that you had while you're popping while it's not empty and like your pre is still bigger than like, or like your element is still bigger than like whatever's on the top's data. It seems like you would pop some nodes and never get them back. Like how do you like, Intuitively, that just seems like it would be the case for you. Like, oh, so, like, technically, like, this while statement, um, it, it exists as a while because um, you basically want to check for, like, while well, the stack is not empty. So you could have a case when you have a stack that has more than one thing in it. So right at the start, because this is an iterative implementation, right? You only pushed one node into your stack, but at some point you may have more than one node in the stack. So the while loop is necessary to ensure that you want to keep popping these stack like items while it's not empty. And you only want to pop the things that have a value that is greater than. Like, does that make sense? Okay. And as yeah. for like why like you may not like so you will never like pop something and lose it because you're saving it as temp. Okay. So like your temp value will be checked later on over here. And you're either adding it as a left child or a right child. Uh -huh. So every time you pop in each iteration of this for loop, you're basically doing the same checks. Wait, like, did, did everyone understand Bobby's question? Like, why, like, it might seem a bit counterintuitive that you want to pop. So, like, I could have written it in a way that, like, maybe has, like, a bit more lines, where it's, like, I have a lot more variables, but this is what I came up with, so. And even though there's two nested loops, this is still only ever O of so it's only ever O of n because of the conditions that are tracking it. So this while loop does not loop for like n times. I think the, yeah, that's basically the main thing. I think it, it loops on average like twice more. Okay. So, and the thing is, as your array gets smaller and smaller, like the value of n also gets smaller and smaller. And that's why on average, like this implementation, worst case would give you like a O of 2n. And the reason why you get O of 2n is you can imagine basically like your stack is keeping track of like uh, all the values that you want to investigate. And every single time you're popping things out of your stack, 
Like you've basically eliminated some values that no longer are relevant to your algorithm. Yeah, and then like if people wanna take a look at the wait, so before we move on, I wanna show you guys the recursive like implementation since we talked about it. But we have questions. Wait, like do people understand? I understand it might be a bit hard to like wrap your head around this. Like do people like understand why it was written this way? Could you like run through an example of recreating like Oh yeah, for sure. So like um, can you just do it on that one, two, three one? Yeah, you? yeah, for sure. So I have a pre array. So this is called pre. And then I have a size variable, which is three, right? And then this is my tree. So to construct this tree, given pre and size, what I would do with this construct tree iterative function, I'll feed it in, and then I'm going to create my first node, which is with the first element over here. So let's just say like this fella doesn't exist yet, right? So all I have is the first node, which is two. So once I've created two, what am I gonna do? For each of the items in, um, so I have my stack here, right? So I'll just call this the stack. So first thing is I'm gonna push it into my stack and then for each, like element in the array, what we're gonna do is we have like a temp node, right? So like there's this guy here, it's called temp. We don't know like what his data value is yet, but while the stack is not empty and my pre arrays element is greater than this two, I'm gonna pop things from the stack. So you can imagine um, my stack is not empty right now, but is my i value, like i zero right now, right? Sorry, um, in this implementation, i starts from one because we already use zero, right? So i is one right now, so that's not true, right? So if that's not true, um, it's gonna increase, and then we'll move on to two. So before we move on to two, there's like a if value over here, so we, know that this one is gonna become the left child. So like basically like this guy is gonna get his first child over here, like based on this bunch of code. Basically all it's doing is peeking for it. So like this is false in the first iteration of this loop, right? So this while loop is false and it gets ignored. So the next thing we wanna consider is, is it null or is it not null? So right now it's null, because only inside this while loop do we set the temp value to something that's truthy, right? So this is false also, so we're only left with this code block. What does this do? It picks for the value in the stack, and then it's gonna say temp.left equals to new node, and then this new node is the current i value, which is one. So in our case, that's gonna be index one, which is referring to the number one. So we just created a new node and we assign it to the left of temp. And then we're gonna push that value into the stack. So right now our stack still has two, but now it also has a one. And we've not popped anything yet. So now that that's done, we're moving on to the next iteration in this for loop where i value is two, right? So remember our size is three, so it's still a valid iteration of the for loop. So i value is two, temp is reset to null again. And is this true? So when my i value is two, it's pointing to the element three within my array. So that's gonna be bigger than one, which is at the top of my stack, right? So since that's the case, we're gonna pop that value. So temp equals to s.pop, so like this guy gets popped up. And then temp is now one. So when temp is one, temp is not null, so this code block is gonna run. So temp.write equals the new node pre like i, so i is two. That's gonna be three, right? So this guy is gonna be three. And then 
we also want to push temp.write into the stack. So this is going to become 3. And Sorry. yeah. Doesn't the while loop keep running because 3 is greater than 2? Oh, my bad. So yeah, so technically, like, this guy will also get popped out. But it's not pop. It's like there was a one, the three forced the one to get popped, and now two is on the side. One to two also get popped. So three is greater than two. Temp equals to s dot pop. So it gets popped out, and I get temp. Temp is not null. Temp dot right equals to two again. So currently temp equals to two. So I have two, it gets three, and I push in the right value inside. So with this implementation, although um, it is the case that you'll keep popping, I think, since the stack is not empty and the pre-value is greater, um, you won't have that added to like a, what do you call it? the root known in a way? Wait, does that make sense? Yeah, I think this still works. Yeah. So the two gets popped and now you get Yeah, it, it kind of just works. Oh, I didn't think about that. But yeah, like, so it will, so let's just try it. Like, yeah. since I have the driver, we can just feed this in. So like my pre-order would be two, one, and three. Save. Ooh, wait, this is the wrong file. Um, yeah, cool. So it, it kind of just works. <laughs> so I feel like this can be like handled. Like, let's just go back to the code. Um, like this edge case that we we're talking about can be handled in a better way. So maybe like one of you guys, like if you're looking through the code like after class, can like refactor it and make a pull request. <laughs> but yeah, so like it, it works, but I guess um, Simran's right to say that like there is some stuff that we do that we're not really catching for in this algorithm, which may not be the best. Yeah, and like um, if you want to see the recursive like implementation, so I have like a main function here. Um, it uses an index to keep track of like the position of um, like what, like the thing in the array, like this or this to where it is in your pre-order traversal. And like this construct tree function takes in pre, which is the array, index, which is the index value, the, the current root, a min and max value, and its size. Yeah, I know it's like taking a lot of things, right? But so basically what you want to do is uh, you want to check for a base case, which is the index is greater or equal to the size. And if it is, you just want to return. But if it's not, you want to match the min and the max values based on the key. So this is the part where like, it gets a little bit complicated because to make sure that it is part of the current subtree, your group of nodes need, like your min needs to be smaller and your max needs to be greater. So if it is, then you assign like a new node and you increase the index by one. So you know like, hey, like I have a new thing in my tree. So if that's still smaller than the size, you just wanna keep recursing. And that's basically it. So like, you keep track of the like number of nodes in your constructed tree using the index value. And you're always looking for a minimum and maximum value. And using the minimum and maximum value, you know how to assign the left and the right. That's kind of it. So like with this, you would not have the problem of the iterative solution where like you have like a bunch of code that like does not really do anything. But yeah, it was not easy to think about this because as you can see from the function, like it has like five params. There's like a lot of things to keep track of in your recursion. And there's probably like a more like better way to write the recursive function, but that's it.
So, do you guys have any questions before we move on to the next, like, problem? Do you guys need a break? So can you scroll up for a second? Yeah. What is index free index? Like what? Oh, so I have a index class. Oh. Okay. Yeah, like that's it. Yeah, I it's just yeah. So like, if you look at the driver, um, what it's really doing is, this is, so we just construct the tree, like there's an array. And that's it. Do you guys need like a toilet break or something? Or are we cool with like, just keep on going? You can keep on going. All right. Yeah, and like if you have any questions, like just please stop me or like ask before we move on. But so the next question is BSD validator. Um, this is a very common question. So like for some perspective, right? Like the previous question that like this question, I got it like uh, at a and um, apparently it was like an easy question. With the validator, what? The first one. Oh. Yeah, like like this question? Yeah. Yeah, I was like, okay, the coming off the traversals was pretty easy, right? Just look at the, the tree that the guy drew and you're like, yeah, like this is going really well. Like I know this shit. But but yeah, so I would say like this question is not hard, but you really needed to know how to use the properties of BST and to really be focused and say, Hey, like this is a BST, I wanna reconstruct a BST, like what helps me do that? And once you kind of figured out, oh, like, hey, I just need to walk through the array and find the, the next biggest thing in the pre-order, you at least have the brute force solution, right? Yeah, so the next question is BSD validator. Like, this is a very common, like, high-frequency problem. It, it's like, I'm sure you've seen this in, I don't even know, is it in, like, Cracking the Coding interview? It probably is, right? Yeah. yeah, like, this is the, like, classic, like, tree problem that you might get. Um, so this question, basically, given a binary tree, and in this case, like a binary search tree, right? Determine if it is a valid, oh wait, sorry, given a binary tree, determine if it is a valid binary search tree. So the assumption here is your tree is binary, but you don't know if it's a binary search tree. So you want to write a function to verify it. And I feel like in the real world, like, there are a lot of implementations for this type of algorithm, right? Because if you know if it's a binary search tree, then there are a lot of things that you can use it for. But if it's not, then implementations of the same thing could be very difficult. Okay, so this is just here to help you, right? Like your interview might not be that nice, in which case you might want to clarify. Like even if they say a binary search tree, right? You should demonstrate your understanding by saying, oh, hey, like, I just want to make sure like we're on the same page, you know, like, so a binary search tree is, and then you start talking about all these properties. Because sometimes like your interviewer might have had like a bad day or like they just forgot, right? That's pretty common. And honestly, like nobody prepares to go and interview you. You prepare a fuck ton to go there, but they're just like, oh yeah, like I was working on this thing and I'm still thinking about it. And then I have to come and interview you. So like be nice and like remind them, oh, so like this is a BST, right? And most of the time they'll say yes. Okay, so how would you approach this problem? So like this is an example and I believe most of the time, when you get an interview question, your interviewer will tell you, like, okay, this is an example. And if you don't get one, like, try to prod it out of your interviewer. Because, like, usually they have some guidelines on, like, what examples that they should give. And this example, by the way, is a very shitty example because it's not specific enough to really help you think about the problem, right? Like, if all you needed to do was verify if all binary trees that only have tree nodes are binary search trees. Your implementation would be really easy. Just look at the thing, look at the left and look at the right, and then you have your algorithm, right? So most of the time, if you get like a overly simplistic example, you can come up with your own, like maybe just something that has one more level of children or like something more complicated. Yeah, so does anybody have like an idea of what you would do?
Yeah, what's up? Are we given uh, actual tree structure to work with, or like a pre-order traversing, like in the bottom of the example? So you get a node. Mm -hmm. And like, what would be the runtime? Yeah, what's up? Wait, that's not necessarily true. Yeah, we'll we'll go into that later. I would start with making a non-terrible example. So. Oh yeah, hey, you guys wanna? I'll my first step. All right, that's that's good advice, I think. So we can just use the like the tree that we had just now, actually, like, cause I don't want to draw it. But yeah, like, say you have like this tree, right? Um. What if you had this tree? Like, would that work? So like one thing I've helped is drawing incorrect examples. So I do have an incorrect example, but I didn't want to give it away that fast. Okay, <laughs> but um, so your approach just now, like, would have worked in most cases. But I think there's an edge case which kind of looks like this. So if you have like a a tree that looks like that. It would kind of fit into your algorithm, but it's not really a BST. And like after looking at this example, it's pretty clear why, right? Yeah. So along with the node, you just throw the maximum value or minimum value that it can be, and, and then keep track of that. So like if you're going to your left subtree, then basically you pass your, your own value and say, also check to make sure nothing's bigger than this. Yeah, basically. Did, did everybody else get that? Like, did that make sense? Oh, like, it's, it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that, that's definitely a valid way to do it, except it's not as optimal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, I have an example of the code written out in terms of like the false example. Like, this would have been what you would have implemented as, right? Like, really straightforward way to think about it. So, if it's not false, just like keep going. And that would pass for this edge case, which we said would not be like a valid implementation. But the one that uh, Brian just talked about would be like something that has a min and max value, right? So, I have like a bunch of functions here that just help me do it. But basically, this is an O of n squared implementation, and then it will look something like that. And it makes sense, right? So you have your base case, and then you have all these other guys. And the min and max value are important for us because it's a binary search tree. Like, if it were not a binary search tree, and if, like, some kind of other tree, right? Like, the min and max value are less significant. And remember, what we want to do here is to validate if a tree is a binary search tree, right? So all we're doing here is, you know, if there exists a left node or if there exists a right node, I want to see if this node's data, like the current node, is smaller than or greater than like my left or my right. And that would basically invalidate the tree. So if um, everything runs and everything's okay, like I never get like a false and we're all good. So yeah, obviously it's all of n squared because like you basically recurse through every everything like like n squared times. So like if all of these conditions fail, like for each node, you need to go through every other node, basically. So do people have an idea about like a more efficient solution? So instead of like so you know the min and max are kind of important, but like, is there a way to do it more, like in a more optimized way? How yeah. Does min and max work? Because, like, oh, so like. I don't see how it has to be you're right, but the way I implemented it for the O of n squared like case is just like this. So I have a node, and then. There is some value, it's tracking that value, and then it returns whichever value that's max. Oh, I was thinking, okay, so here's what I was actually thinking is basically, 
you recursively go, but you don't like surf through the min and max of the entire thing to make sure everything is like, mm -hmm. less than you. You send your own value down, and everything checks itself. And so everything only has to check itself once because its parents are the only things that matter. Um, and so for, from the beginning, you basically start off like the root would start off at the left with min int min and max itself, and then those three things, or those two numbers, I guess, and, and the the next node would be passed down, and so you'd self police at each point, and then pass your value into the next two functions for min and max for left and right, and so basically everyone would police itself, and it should only run once per node. Yep, yeah, that sounds. Just about right. Okay. So like the implementations over here, and you guys have access to this. So it's like an O of N, as you say, because like you only like go through every node once, right? So basically, like uh, you want to check for some values, and then here's like a like a hacky way to do it. So I like to reduce the amount of code. I'm always returning booleans, right? So to make sure that I only use each once, I just return a boolean for the left node and the right node of the, the current nodes like left and right but that's it so you can also use in order traversal which we haven't talked about but I feel like we should because in order traversal is I feel like different from like I, I don't know like it's, it's a thing like um, it's very rare to get an in order traversal question like from from like all the interviews I've done it's just so rare. You either get something that's pre-order or something where like you need to use pre-order and in order. Like it's always something and in order. But I feel like so people often, or at least personally, I sometimes like um, neglect in order traversal. Like, it's not something that would come to my mind like straight away. But for this question, you could have used in order traversal. And the way to do that would have been to traverse the tree in in order and keep track of the previous node. Which is kind of like what you were talking about. But in the in order way, basically. <laughs> yeah, so like, I had like the counter example of like, so this tree over here is the tree like up here. So like, if you had run that, like, where's that tree? Like, this tree. So if you had run is BST false using this tree, it would have passed. But with all the other implementations with this tree, you're gonna get a false value. But yeah, so like, I would say this is a very common, and out of the common questions, this is one of the relatively easier questions for trees. Because like, this is basically testing like fundamental knowledge about a BST. And if you get stumped on this type of question, most of the time your interviewer will be like, oh hey, like, what are the properties of a BST? Like, how can you use them? Like, he would give you some hints, he or she would give you some hints. And then it's like super clear. I feel like some other questions, even after a hint, it may not be that clear. And you're like, okay, like I knew that, but what can I do with it, right? But but yeah, so with this, we kind of can go to like the next question. And uh, the next question is case smallest element in the binary search tree. So the idea is you have a binary search tree and you want to find the case smallest in the tree. like. For example, um, I don't know why. So this tree is wrong, guys. <laughs> There's no six in the tree. Um, but, oh, I know why. So there's some history to why that diagram is still there. Originally, this question was not case smallest element in BST. It was max path sum in BST, which is like you want to calculate the maximum path. of. So like in this case, it would have been like, Two, one, three is a path, so you get six. So in the tree that is like a lot longer in height, you would have multiple paths with different um, maximum sums of the path, and you could also have like negative values in there, which would change like the maximum sum, right? So it was originally that question, but then like um, we figured it might be a bit too difficult to cover like within this class. Or at least to get the optimal like solution for that question, but if you're interested, definitely like look into it. Like, um, I feel like trees are often asked because it's easy to make a tree question hard, right? Like the previous question, um, BST validator. So before we start this question, like 
it could have easily been BST iterator, right? Like create a generator function or like some kind of function that iterates through a BST. It's the same concept, but it like adds a twist, right? So instead of traversing it and just validating it, so validating is super easy, right? You have some condition return true or false, and you can do it recursively. But if you have to iterate through the BST, right, then there are like a lot of other things you need to think about, like what order of traversal you should use, like how should you print the things out. And like there are many ways to like tweak your question with trees. That's why I feel like trees are often one of the harder questions. So this problem is basically if I give you a binary search tree and ask you to find like the second smallest element, right? Basically, that's the element that's one smaller than the smallest. Does that make sense? So if I have a tree with five nodes and I ask you to find the fifth smallest element, that means to find the biggest element. Like, does that make sense? Okay. So how would people approach this problem? And like, ignore the, the diagram. Can we get the length as or not the length, like the size of the tree is parameter? I don't think so. But you can easily like write a implementation to find like the size of nodes or like depth of tree if you needed it. So how would you like if I gave that information to you, how would you like tackle this problem? So like if you knew the length or the size of the left and right subtree, you could figure out which direction to look. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you have like two things on the left and five things on the right, then you know that the root is the third biggest thing. Um, and so you could go from there. If you're looking for the fourth, or the third smallest, I mean. So if you're looking for the fourth smallest, then you go right and then left all the way, and something like that. So in that implementation, like regardless of whether or not you were given like the height of the tree or the number of nodes, you would have needed to traverse through the tree and find a way to mark your nodes, right? Because like otherwise, like it's not like I'm giving you like, oh, the left side has a height of two and the right side has a height of four. Yes, that's what I believe. Yeah, so marking your nodes is one strategy you could use. And that depends on whether or not your interviewer allows you to change the node data structure. So if you encounter a solution that may require changing some assumptions, you should always clarify if you're an interviewer and ask them. And most of the time, so if you ask me this as an interviewer, like, oh, can I change the node? I'll be like, no, you can't, until you give me like a solution that works. And then we can talk about changing the node. But it, it really depends. So some interviewers, it depends on what they're looking out for. Yeah, but I would say without editing or like without changing your basic assumptions about what a tree node looks like, you're still able to do this question optimally. But that's the right idea. Like how could you do the same thing but without marking the nodes? We have like 15 minutes left and I feel like we only have time to like walk through the code. I kind of want to like do a code along, but like I guess we don't have time. Can you like start an in order traversal until it just counts k times? So you go in order and then you count k times. How would you make sure that it's the smallest, like k smallest though? So it's a binary search tree. Mm -hmm. Which means if you go in order, you're going in the order of the numbers, right? Yep. So the first thing you hit is the smallest, guaranteed. And the second thing you hit, or the first leap, pretty much. So I think that would have been. So what would be the runtime of that? No, no, because you have to get to the, to make the in order, you have to go through the entire Yeah. I don't think that's all. You don't have to complete the whole traversal, because you can stop as soon as you hit the K part of it. 
But they still they have to get through. The worst case is the last one. So that's okay. So it is O of n, but like I think my solution is like O of log n plus k. It's like slightly faster. <laughs> no, no, like any optimization in like uh, what do they call this again? I forgot. Like like the like whatever big O stands for. Um. Yeah, like asymptotic, like runtime, whatever. Like even if like for small cases, it's only like a few more iterations more. As long as like it's asymptotically like faster, it's a valid optimization. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like so there is a way to do it, and I feel like you guys are on the right track with in order search. All right, let's just go through it, since you guys kind of have it. Uh, yeah, there we go. So over here, like it's still the same stuff. And then we have a binary tree. So yeah, like one thing though, like sometimes when you do problems, it's easy to like confuse like past problems that you did before. So like it's for me, it's super easy to confuse questions that involve binary trees with questions that involve binary search trees. So like I could do a problem yesterday and when I look at the same problem today, I'm like, oh yeah, like, I did this yesterday. And it turns out, hey, like the one yesterday was for a binary search tree and the one like that you're looking at right now is not and that's why the implementation like is all wrong. Yeah, so so over here like I just use an array list to do like some recursion and the reason why you needed the array list is um, to keep track of the k values. So what does in order search do? So the base cases are over here. So like if the array size is greater than or equal to k, you want to return. And so you're always adding things to your array. And that's why it's the base case. So if the left node is not null, you want to keep searching. And then this is basically in order search, right? Like left, node, right, basically. So this is the recursive implementation, and it only looks like, what, 10 lines of code, right? But I feel like if you didn't really get how to use that in order, you know, it would have been like difficult to wrap your head around this, yeah. Can you that Wait, like this? Yeah. So like, um, it's the same thing, I think, except like what you had said, like, uh, you didn't really say like how you would keep track of the k value, or maybe like my memory proves me wrong. But but do you want to like repeat what you you had in mind? What I said was basically you stop at the k number. So yeah, you'd have to keep a list of them if to do that at all. But I think that's what I was thinking. Okay, cool. But yeah, so there is like a iterative solution. It's basically the same thing with the stack. Like we've done like a pre-order search using a stack just now. But so like in order can be achieved with a stack too. But yeah, you basically do the same things. Um, it's log n plus k because log n is your height of the binary tree, right? So you basically need to traverse at least one node in your tree and you also need to traverse like k number of nodes. Like, does that make sense in terms of like run times? Does not be k log n? No, or it wouldn't. Yeah. yeah, it wouldn't be k yeah. log n. Like k log n would be like, you would do like a for loop for each thing in your like array and then you would like, yeah, basically. But, but yeah, this, both implementations, iterative or not, like have, O log n plus k. Yeah, and like one thing though, so you point out like a good point, which is like sometimes when you're talking about it, it's not as clear cut in terms of runtime analysis. So it's not until you actually write the code down, then you know that, oh, hey, like my implementation is of this runtime. Because I feel like sometimes we often like 
don't see some hidden like runtime costs. Like you just think, oh yeah, like I'll just retrieve this value when that retrieval is actually like O of K where K is some value that could be significant. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to talk about like how to do it in like um, less than O of log N plus K time. So that's like the marking values thing that we're talking about. So you could technically like change the BST node structure. So you just need to check for a number on the left node and that would allow you to basically always know like which k value you're at. Yeah, and then you basically have a log n implementation, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, I feel like if you get asked this question, most of the time people will be able to get the O of log n plus k like runtime solution. But then you get stumped when your interviewer is like, oh hey, like it can be faster. Can you try to give me an answer? Because this implementation, so I feel like a lot of times optimizations are like not always algorithmic. So like you need to refresh your assumptions about the problem. Like in this case, it involves changing like one base assumption, which was what the tree node looked like. Um, I have like another example. Uh, it was, I think, some kind of linked list problem that I was like asked in an interview. And then there was a question about like, how do you find like a duplicate node in O of one time. I was like, what? <laughs> How can you find anything in O of one time, right? But there were like very specific um, details to the context of that linked list question. And in the end, like the solution was something as simple as just changing the pointers. So you had some information that was previously made available after you completed your algorithm and then to optimize that you could have added like a base case to remove like the O of N case of checking for the last like item. So you know you have a linked list, right? If you have a circular linked list, you can't know the like the nth or the nth minus one node until you've gone all the way there, right? So how do you check for this equals to this? Yeah, so, so it was like a really interesting problem that I was like, wow, I didn't know I could do it like that. But I feel like that's something very common to experience at like an interview. It's like, these guys have been coding forever, right? Like they know like all the tricks. So mm. sometimes you get questions that are not that like textbook in that sense. So we're kind of done with like today's class. Do you guys have questions or like feedback and stuff like that? That would be useful. Nope. I hope it was useful for you guys. Um, I definitely think that trees is one of the like most important data structures that you need to know, whether it's for interviews or for just software engineering in general. Like trees are so useful. Like you can imagine like any kind of like common thing that you use on the internet that's based on the tree. Like for example, like a lot of like social media like websites or like applications all use graphs, which are like a lot of things from a graph they turn into a tree. They turn into binary source tree, so it's easy to create an index. Almost all databases use B trees, like binary trees, as their foundation. So like anything that's data related always comes back to trees. I just want to add on to that that a lot of times um, you'll be asked to do stuff in terms of editing JSONs or like XMLs or stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. That's this is all really awesome. structure. So usually you'll have a library to do that, but oftentimes in order to give like their questions more like real world, one of those companies will ask you to, for example, build like a JSON parser, or like go from like straight like text in XML to like a, a graph or a, like a tree representation or something like that. Yeah. You guys have any other questions? Oh, like I I want to like share with you guys the hardest tree question I ever got. Like, this is unlikely that you get this problem. I don't even know why it came up, but like, uh, you guys have, have you guys done problems where you're asked to do like arithmetic, like in a string? You know, it's like a valid parenthesis or like, you know, you have um, plus minus times divide in a string and you have a bunch of numbers. You also have parenthesis, like square brackets, parenthesis, like any like math kind of operators, right? So the typical string question is, give me the correct result of that string. So you kind of need to parse the string, you need to keep track of um, 
where the parentheses are and like where all the like plus and minuses are and the like the sequence of addition, subtraction versus multiplication and div like division. Did they ask you to build a syntax tree from a string or what? No, so like I got asked to do like arithmetic in a tree. So the tree nodes could have like times or like divide or plus or minus values and then each path is like a valid like um, arithmetic path. So you wanted to make sure, so the last node would be like a result. So you basically wanted to do the arithmetic as you traverse the tree. And then you want to know like, was the result valid or not? Yeah. No, that, I, do, I, I took so long to like do that question. How is your solution? What did it look like? Did you do like bottom up and like programming on, on the Merton tree or what? I did like DP with like hash maps. And it was a very like verbose implementation. Like I had to write so much fucking code on the whiteboard. <laughs> like it was not something that you could just like, oh yeah, like you have like a picture of what it is and it just came out nicely. It was like, oh, there's this edge case and then there's this edge case and there's just no way to like do it nicely. Uh, did you find, did you look this problem up and there was still no nice answer? Yeah. Or at least like runtime wise, there was no like nice answer. Cause you'd have to like check like every yeah. possible subpath. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Bad memories. Okay. Um, yo, so if you come like every week, we have a website, and on the website, there's like a Google form for like feedback. Yeah, so if you like didn't like what I said today, you can go and like complain about me. Um, and if not, we have our next session, I think, is the programming competition, right? No, we have one more. We have oh, graphs. Uh, right. Nice. You guys are gonna love graphs. Graphs are like harder shit. <laughs> <laughs>